I don't know how to describe Obama um, as somebody, he's now in office two years, um, uh, just when we needed an angry black man. <laughs> we didn't get one. <laughs> he does have a nice dog. <laughs> um, uh, let's just do a checklist of what uh, we know a lot about Bush Cheney. I've been doing a book for the last couple of years about Cheney, basically based on people I knew that were inside. I, I'm long of tooth and there were people, you know, it's inevitable in a bureaucracy. Uh, you're a one-star general and you get assigned to the vice president's office. And um, uh, by the way, if you can't hear me yell, I, I've gone through speeches in which after it was over, half the people said they couldn't hear a word I said. So do say something, um, just uh, yell. Um, but um, uh, you're a one-star general and you get assigned to the vice president's office. And uh, maybe you knew him when he was secretary of defense in, in, um, under George Bush one uh, in the first Gulf War when he was uh, rational, so it seems. Didn't want to, if he's the man who uh, defended um, George Bush's decision not to go into Baghdad, and if you remember when we had that slaughter that we had that we called Gulf War I. Um, but he was a different person after 9-11, as I think most of you have some sense of. And so I did know people in that process, and I couldn't write much about him. Um, how to describe uh, the Bush-Cheney years would be, I, I was telling a, a group of faculty people earlier, and um, uh, I haven't, the, the book I'm doing isn't published, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but just to give you an idea how differently they thought from what, as, as many dark thoughts as you may have about what America did after 9-11, whatever the justification was, um, I, I would argue that what I'm really writing about is about how eight or nine um, neoconservative wackos, if you will, um, overthrew the American government, took it over. And it's not only that, it's not only that the neocons took it over, it's how easily they did it. How Congress disappeared, how the press became part of it, how uh, the public uh, acquiesced, and how all of us I guess in the sense of uh, payback and rage and fear, a tremendous amount of fear in America, um, uh, we all sort of signed on to what we call now the global GWOT, the global war on terror, which for this government, my government still exists. I talked to somebody the other day in the, um, if I lose track, somebody tell me where I was. I'm ruminating here, but um, I talked to somebody Saturday before I came about Ben Ali a man in the intelligence community, a very decent, uh, believe me, is, as you can under, it does, makes total sense, many of the people, uh, uh, most of the overwhelming percentage of people want to do their job right, in, 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 whether in the CIA or the Joint Special Operations Command, et cetera, et cetera, um, and uh, around the world. That's just a natural instinct. Everybody wants to do the job right. So I, it's hard for me to, I'll, but I'll just tell you, the, the thinking that goes on um, I mentioned what happened in Tunisia about the implications of which I think will be felt. My guess is uh, we're talking about there are a lot of countries in North Africa um, uh, where there's economic distress as there was in Tunisia, um, uh, Morocco, uh, Algeria, etc., cetera, um, where you could see a lot of trouble. But my American friend, this is somebody in the, in the Joint Special Operations business, his first remark was, oh my God, he was such a good ally. You know, he was. He was a great ally in, in the global war on terror. That's the way we do look at things. Never mind that uh, maybe he did chase down terrorists, Al-Qaeda, if you will, for us. But you have to wonder, which I did not say to my friend, um, uh, being reasonably polite at that moment. <laughs> I did not say that, but for every terrorist he captured, how many more did he make? I mean, how many more? We're, we complain bitterly when Iran captures three American students. Uh, the, they released the woman, but the other two men are kept there. We really, we complain bitterly in America about the lack of uh, jurisprudence and the lack of a good legal system. And how many people are now still in Gitmo, Guantanamo, suffering away? Over 200 still. We claim they can't get rid of them. Nobody wants them, but the truth is, 
that if they weren't Al-Qaeda when we captured them, and most of them were not, as many of you probably understand they are now, after seven, eight, nine years of being incarcerated without any hearings or any rights. So we don't always look at ourselves in ways we should. But in any case, the Cheney-Bush years, I, I can just describe this scene that I was talking about earlier today, which is that in, uh, in early April of uh, 2003, after we won, quote unquote, the war before the uh, insurgents, uh, dead-enders, as um, Mr. Uh, Rumsfeld called them initially, before they took the war, before the war, the other war began, the war of attrition, um, um, uh, there was uh, looting of the artifacts. There was a big sort of, it was a huge story in the United States and I'm sure around the world, um, the various gangs that were looting everything. There's a lot of looting in Tunisia right now. That's sort of a byproduct of unrest. Um, the various gangs uh, looted uh, the, the museums, et cetera, and there was a big hue and cry, and Rumsfeld was asked about it, and his uh, basic attitude was sort of, um, uh, boys will be boys, you know, this is uh, the price of freedom. So, but in the Cheney shop, in, in, I can write about it in ways I could not then, because I didn't want to expose anybody who was there. In the Cheney shop, the attitude was, what's this? What, what are they all worried about the politicians and the press? They're all worried about some looting? And wait a second, Sunnis don't like Shia? And there's no WMD? And there's no democracy? Don't they get it? We're going to change mosques in the cathedrals. And when we get all the, all the oil, nobody's going to give a damn. That's the attitude. We're going to change mosques in the cathedrals. That's an attitude that pervades I'm here to say a large percentage of the uh, Special Operations Command, the Joint Special Operations, the man, um, uh, Stanley McChrystal, and is, is, uh, is the, the one who got in trouble because of the article in Rolling Stone, and his follow-on, a, a Navy Admiral named um, McRaven, Bill McRaven. All our members are at least supporters of Knights of Malta. McRaven attended, so I understand, the recent um, annual convention of the Knights of Malta they had in uh, Cyprus. Uh, a few months back in November. Um, they're all believers. Many of them are members Opus Dei. Um, they do see what they're doing. And this is not an atypical attitude among some military. As It's a, it's a crusade, literally. They see themselves as the, uh, uh, as the protectors of the Christians, uh, the protecting them from the Muslims in the 13th century. And this is their function. They have little insignias, they have coins they pass among each other, which crusader coins, and they have insignia that, that reflect that, uh, the whole notion that uh, this is a war, a spiritual war. Look, um, Knights of Malta does great stuff. They do a lot of charity work, so does Opus Dei. It's a very extreme, extremely religious um, Roman Catholic um, uh, sect, if you will. Um, but for me, it's always, I always think when I think of them, I always think of the lineup we used about Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun was a German rocket scientist who invented the V2. And after World War II, we had a secret program of bringing and sort of denazifying some of the German scientists who were valuable to our own uh, uh, energy, our own missile program. And we brought him here, I think it was called Paperclip, secret program. And uh, we brought him here and sort of recreated his life. You know, he was, this new, he was this scientist who was a rocket scientist, and there was a wonderful satirist named um, Tom Lear. Some of you old-timers might remember him. He wrote ditties, and one of his ditties about Werner von Braun was, oh yes, Werner von Braun, he aimed for the moon but often hit London with his rockets. So the trouble with some of these religious groups is they may have good things, but right now uh, there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of anti-Muslim feeling in the military community. So, what has Obama done? Obama has turned over uh, in his first year, basically he turned over the conduct of the war to the men who were prosecuting it. To Gates, to Mullen, the, uh, the, uh, who is the um, uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs. And um, in early March, as I recreate it, and um, um, uh, nothing is written in stone, but I'm just telling you what, what I found in my, my talking and working on this for years. We had a general running the war in Afghanistan named McKernan. 
McKernan, unlike uh, McChrystal, his deputy um, at the time, Rodriguez, unlike um, uh, Petraeus, unlike uh, Eikenberry, uh, I can name, they were all together at West Point, class of 40, 74, 75, 76, what they called, we always call it sort of the West Point Protective Association. McKernan was William and Mary, not West Point, and Gates went to see him in March of, uh, of 09, sort of the first big exploration on behalf of the new Obama administration. What do you need to win the war? Well, the correct answer was, he said 300,000. Of course, he, he knew he wouldn't get it. He was just saying to win, that's what it's gonna take. There was a Russian study. The Russians did some uh, wonderful studies after they were sort of beaten to death in, um, in Afghanistan, what we called the great victory of um, of America um, versus the, uh, the communists, uh, our, our surrogate war there we fought in the 80s. Um, when the Russians left, they did a number of class studies that have since been put back in the archives by the Politburo. But when they were out, they showed that um, uh, the Russians estimated just, just to seal off Pakistan um, from um, uh, Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush, 180,000 troops alone just to seal it off so you couldn't get the cross-border stuff that we're so worried about in terms of um, uh, fighting the war in Afghanistan, the ability of the Taliban to retreat into Pakistan. Um, and the, by the way, there were studies done, two large studies done in, uh, when we first, uh, right after 9-11, about going into Afghanistan. One was done by the national, on one of the war colleges, and they were both extremely critical of the prospects of victory. And it, uh, there was a, 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 a drive made to um, uh, formalize the studies. They were ad hoc studies. Uh, and the vice president, then Cheney, sort of stopped them. Uh, nobody wanted to talk about history. We're sort of, anyway, we're a history in America. We're anti-history, as you know. Uh, else, why would we make the same mistake we always make? And I'm, I remain convinced that if uh, Vin Van Tu, the South Vietnamese premier in 1975 when South Vietnam fell, if somehow we could have erected a three mile, mile, mile high wall around his, um, his palace, we'd still be airlifting food in there and supplies supporting the Democratic Republic of South Vietnam. We don't like to lose, we don't know how to lose, which explains, I think, a lot about Afghanistan. In any case, um, uh, Obama did advocate very quickly any control, I think, right away to the people that were running the war for what reason, I don't know. Um, I can tell you there's a scorecard I always keep um, that I always look at. Torture, yep, still going on. Um, it's more complicated now, the torture. There's not as much of it, but uh, one of the things we did, uh, ostensibly to improve conditions of prisoners, we demanded that the American soldiers operating in Afghanistan could only hold a suspected Taliban for f four days, 96 hours. If not, after four days, they could not be sure that this person was not a Taliban, he must be freed. Instead of just holding them and then making them Taliban, you had to actually do some, some work to make a determination in the field, tactically, in the field. And so what happens, of course, is after three or four days, bang, bang, I'm just telling you, they turn them over to the Afghan, and by the time they take three steps away, the shots are fired. And that's going on, that hasn't stopped. Um, it's not just me that's complaining about it. The, the, the stuff that goes on in the field is still going on in the field. Secret prisons, yep, absolutely. Oh, you bet, we're still running secret prisons. Um, most of them are in North Africa. The guys running them are mostly out of Djibouti. We have stuff in Kenya. Doesn't mean they're in Kenya, but they're in that area. Um, assassinations, um, let's see. Uh, Eikenberry gave the wrong number, so he was replaced by McChrystal. Stanley McChrystal had been in charge of the Joint Special Operations Command from 03 to 07 under Cheney. In the beginning under Cheney, what I'm telling you is sort of hard to take because of ice. In the beginning, they would get their orders. They would call up on satellite phones from the field to Cheney's office and get authority, basically, to whack people. Uh, sometimes names were given, sometimes just generic authority was given. Um, this was going on. Uh, there's still an enormous amount of whacking going on right now. 
Um, what happened is after McChrystal ran into trouble and he was replaced, Petraeus took over the war, General Petraeus. Uh, they call him King, King David, David Petraeus. Um, and he has done this in the last six, eight months. He has doubled up on the nightly, nightly assassinations. He's escalated the bombing. He's gotten much tougher. His argument is, let's squeeze him, let's bomb him, let's hit him. And then, of course, uh, they'll be open to negotiation. And negotiation for us uh, means that anybody who wants to negotiate has to totally renounce any uh, allegiance to the Taliban or any of the Pashtun world, almost in, in essence. And of course, it's not going to happen. Of course, I don't know any serious, truly don't know any serious officer or special operator or civilian who's been in the war um, that has any confidence about it. We're not going to prevail. In Af there are some better things. There are some units that are doing, in some valleys, we're going from villages and we are doing a little better in terms of supplying some security. But in general, uh, the insurgency has spread. Wherever we are, uh, the Taliban have moved. They're moving north. Uh, the insurgency is much more widespread. It's much more violent. Uh, there's American boys are being chewed up. Um, as some of you know, who know the Pashtun world, uh, revenge comes, can come in two generations, but revenge, particularly if a male is killed, senior male, revenge must take place or you're dishonored. Uh, we, have, we have a legacy there that's going to be very hard to pay off. Um, and uh, uh, it's there. It's not even hard to see. If you, you, can almost, um, you can get a, an account of the increase in air raids. They make them public. Um, the targeting is, you know, here's, here's the way it works. Um, we have reconnaissance missions, and uh, the, that are, we have a group in Washington known as the Joint Reconnaissance Committee. And when, the, when we have missions, let's say, off the coast of China, we have a, 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 a Boeing 707s that fly figure eights doing electronic monitoring off China. They used to be mostly off Russia. They're off China. They're off North Korea now. Uh, we still do an awful lot of intelligence collection. These missions are all put into a book, and they're approved by the president. So the president, or his delegate, but the president basically is given these notions that you have to approve this mission for the next three months or whatever um, because of there's a risk. And yet every night, American predators are going off, controlled by the CIA and the Air Force, going off, hitting targets more and more in Pakistan uh, that are undefined, that the intelligence is not very clear on, often very bad. Collateral damage is enormously high because uh, we're going after a member of the, of the, let's say, the Pakistani Taliban, and in that society, the women live right next to the men. They're in separate quarters, but they're there. And, and, um, and boom, the predator um, wipes out a, a, a whole building, clearly, and kills an enormous amount of, of uh, people who have nothing to do with uh, um, their, their non-combatants. Um, none of these missions are approved anywhere except in the military chain of command. It's a very strange system. And he has not tampered with it. I, I think things are better in the sense that um, uh, I, I don't think Obama's authorizing quite as much. There isn't that much to do. The war on terror proceeds. We still have a capability to operate. I don't know what's going to happen in North Air Africa because of this. This is going to change the game, this being Tunisia. Tunisia is almost impossible to assess this too early, but um, it's going to scare the hell of a lot of people. Um, you, you know, you. It, it is up to a point about oil. I, when I started looking at Cheney from a different point of view uh, two years ago, I didn't think so. I thought ideology, I thought protecting Israel, a lot of it is oil. Um, you talk to people and they will tell you, uh, yeah, there's the wind and the sun, but when you get in an airplane, where's it coming from? And there's always been an understanding. We tolerate the Saudis. Um, we support the Saudis, who we know do supply an awful lot of Salafis, and there's still their various charities are supplying them, often the same people we're targeting. And uh, it, there is a, certainly, a, uh, certainly, we see their influence in, in the Iraqi war supporting the Sunnis, um, the Sunni um, awakening, et cetera. Um, uh, and the implicit, I, I would argue that there's nothing subtle about what we do in oil. 
um, if you think about it, again, this is something I talked about earlier, um, we hit, we and the Brits always assumed some imperial right to oil in the Middle East. We go in the, Iran in, in the 50s, the Brits controlled so much, many areas in the Gulf where there was oil, starting uh, many years before that. It's always been open, the relationship the West has towards Middle East oil, which is, it's us. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that oil was a very strong issue in this, in this case, in the case of uh, going into Iraq, for sure. Uh, oil is, um, and the implicit understanding many of the kingdoms in the Gulf region have is they're allowed to continue their despotic ways, if you will, or the less than democratic ways, although we espouse democracy, with the understanding that we're basically there to back them up, that we're there, we're there to keep them in power as long as the oil and gas flow. That's sort of the American mantra, and the British mantra too, but it's mostly ours now. And I think that's, you know, some of you may disagree, I think probably a lot do, but I think that's basically the understanding, whether it's articulated or not, um, the, the, the various sheikdoms understand they stay in power as long as we get what we want. Kuwait, Iran, other places. Um, I'm not necessarily talking about this place. Because this place, no, he's, he's, um, he's, uh, he's different. He's special. Uh, he is. Uh, he's, um, um, he's smarter than most. And um, I do believe that. In any case, and so if I start going through the war and the foreign policy of Obama, it's so depressing. But uh, we can dispense with Afghanistan to say there is a way out. The easy way out is to accept the reality of Mullah Omar. I'm not, this is not just me talking. These are an awful lot of people I know talking. Um, the solution is Mullah Omar, despite the fact we say otherwise, he still seems to be pretty much the dominant person. The intelligence community will always say somebody else is, and they'll, always, they'll make the case that um, He's been replaced, he's now been more centralized and marginalized. I still think he was the great leader who came out of the 80s as, with his one eye and his bravery. He's not an ayatollah, he's not a scholar, he's a Talib boy, he's, a, he's learning, not even learned it. But um, he's the guy that I think if you want a way out, you can make a deal with because he will deliver. If you give him, you know, it's gonna take a lot of money uh, I don't think he's interested in, in imperialism. He's not interested in knocking down buildings anywhere in the West or attacking us. And I'm, I'm just telling you there is a way out. We're not going to take it. Um, uh, uh, I, I think the president is convinced there's a, that he can squeeze out some sort of victory. In Iraq, just to show you, I don't think anybody in America seems to understand why Maqtad Sadr would join in with Maliki. Maliki, by the way, has 22 years in Syria in the Maqabra out there. Uh, he's one tough dude. I mean, 22 years since the Syriac Maqabra. That's pretty good. We worked for Nasif. And anyway, uh, um, I, I don't think, um, uh, I, I don't understand why it's just there. Uh, Maqtad Sadr would not come and join Maliki unless it was guaranteed we're out. There's only, that's the only way he's gonna join us. This is not original wisdom. There's just no way he didn't join the, the and he made that, that moderate speech two weeks ago, which he supported the government. I even talked vaguely about trying to do something about the Sunnis, which if they want to get a country going, they can. If they want to keep it cold, cold I think they probably could make a deal. It involves money and oil and um, uh, autonomy. Um, but he did make a speech. Uh, circa uh, Maktad was uh, was emulating, or if you will, uh, uh, channeling um, Nasrallah with the same sort of uh, humor that it's often hard, people who tell me if they hear it in the original Arabic, it's more urbane and more witty of Nasrullah's speeches than you get in the translation. He tried to make a comical asides and he was, in, he was very moderate, Maktad Asadar, but he also made the point out. I have an American friend, some of you might remember the name, Scott Ritter. He was the, one of the original um, hardline um, uh, UNSCOM, the UN inspectors. And Scott was um, uh, very tough on Iran, but a, uh, very tough on Iraq during the 80s. He, in the 90s, he worked for um, um, Ambassador Ukeas from Sweden. And, um, but by, by the early, um, uh, by the middle 90s, it was, it was clear to him 
there weren't any WMD there. Before the war, it was very clear, and he began to say so, so he became sort of PNG. But nonetheless, because of his contacts in UNSCOM, um, about, oh, this is a story he told me five years ago, a major oil company, my guess is, he wouldn't say which one, but it was, I was pretty sure it was Exxon, um, Exxon Mobil, called him down to Texas to meet with the, the senior guy, Lee Raymond this would be, if, if it was Exxon um, Mobil. Um, and the issue was, can Scott get together a team of former UN, the UN inspectors were half inspectors and half special forces. There was always a fear that the Iraqis would do something. So half the guys in the, half the guys that claimed to be scientists were either in the, in the, um, in the, uh, the British um, um, uh, uh, SS, you know, special units, or the Australian units, the Germans had some people in there, Spechnas, the Russians were in there. And because he had so much famili familiarity with all of the very hard-nosed special operators who, um, in, in case of a firefight, would draw a circle and kill an awful lot of people before they let any of the um, European ins or UN inspectors get captured, this particular oil company asked Scott if he would, they want to, they want to make a, they want to make an investment. This is 05, maybe even 04, in oil in Basra, in one of the, in the, one of the fields in the south, and they wanted him to his assessment of security, and particularly if they used an international force and brought in uh, as many um, uh, Middle Easterners as they could from various countries. And Scott told me about it a few days later, and he said, I asked when they were all done. I said, Well, let me ask you one question. Are you an American company? They said, well, of course. He said, forget it. You just, you know, they'll burn the oil before they give it to you. And I don't think that's bad. If you think, I don't think it was a bad assessment. I don't see any American majors getting a big field in the South. We get, we're getting some secondary positions, but the, the, certainly the Russians and Chinese, and I do think it's fair to say that there's no interest at all in giving us oil. There's no interest in oil in keeping us there. And yet, our, our vice president, Mr. Biden, goes to goes to uh, Iraq uh, four or five days ago and announces that, oh, we're going to stick around afterwards. You know, we won't have troops there, but we'll have special units. So we'll have some uh, training groups and others. No, he had, a, he had a walk the cat back two days later. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think we're going to get a base out of there. Uh, I don't necessarily think that um, uh, it's going to be totally pro-Iran, as everybody's so afraid. I think there's going to be some nationalism there. I think the key player that we don't even recognize in America, we don't recognize the extent to which Turkey is becoming dominant. We don't ex uh, uh, understand the extent to which there's incredible trading going on between the Turks, the Syrians, the Iranians, and the Iraqis. Pipelines are being organized. They've signed a number of deals. Nothing's happened yet. They're, not, they're beginning to, to mobilize. There's gonna be a, a, a super train, a uh, bullet train between uh, um, Aleppo and into central um, uh, Turkey. Who would have thought of that 10 years ago? Um, Saddam was um, um, uh, insane. Uh, again, I was saying earlier, Saddam, if you had chicken during Saddam's days, uh, it probably came from Brazil. He didn't trade. Now there's incredible trade that's going to undercut the sanctions we're trying to impose on Iran, uh, which we remain, for some reason, totally convinced is going to be a nuclear state. Uh, despite the fact there's no empirical basis for that evidence, no evidence for that, that just doesn't matter. It's an American belief and a Western European belief. Never mind there's no evidence, we know. Um, it's like um, there were two fatwas th uh, issued on oil by ayatollahs saying we're, uh, on nuclear weapons in the last 30 years, one by Khomeini in 87, one by Khomeini, if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, last April, in April of 2009, um, and the only fatwa we believe is the one on uh, Salman Rushdie. We don't believe the other ones. The Salman Rushdie one we believe. That's, they really tried to, yeah, it's true, they did. But I, I, the other one should be taken seriously too, I think. Anyway, um, um, I'm, this is a minority opinion. Uh, so Iraq, and what else is going on under our nose? The Turks are doing a lot of business with the Kurds. They're doing a lot of business with everybody. Um, under our nose and gaining a foothold, still maintaining a tie with the Israelis about which we have to talk, alas. Um, Pakistan, I've written, last year I wrote a long piece about the American panic about nuclear weapons there, which is, believe me, acute. 
We are in a total, complete frenzy about the fact they have, what, 70 to 80 to 100 weapons. They've miniaturized. Uh, for some reason, um, uh, if you remember, in the early days, we looked the other way as they began to, uh, do, because we needed them for the war in Afghanistan. So America looked the other way when they began to go nuclear. And we're sorry now for that, uh, I hope. Um, but there's a, uh, the country is basically on the edge of despair. Zadari is, um, um, you know, I saw him about, I had dinner with him a couple of years. I was in Pakistan. He invited me for dinner. I don't know why. I knew his wife. Maybe that's it. I don't know why. But it was at the time of, um, uh, there had been a, uh, in, in, there had been a terrible, uh, there was the, um, the Taliban had gone in the, Swat, in the Swat Valley and muscled their way in. A lot of young, uneducated toughs, and the uh, Pakistani army came roaring back. And if you remember, there was uh, a, a tremendous amount of killing and, and bloodletting on all sides. And there was a tent cities, two or three created, anywhere from 600,000 people up in the summer of, this would be the summer of 09. We're in tent cities. And uh, if you went on the road from Islamabad to Peshawar, Peshawar you could see these 10 cities, it was 100, and the day I went was 117 degrees in August of 09. And there was nothing between, uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people living with a piece of green cloth between them and the sun. And sanitation was bad, it was just a horrific place. So I get back and I, I go to see Zadari, uh, Mr. 10% as he's known, and he's, uh, he's huddled in the presidential palace um, I, I believe me, uh, more frightened uh, of his uh, of his life than um, uh, than I, I would even guess he needs to be. Although I, certainly, I don't think he'll take a walk down the street. Uh, but anyway, um, and I I told him, I said, explain this ten city, and he said, well, he said, this is the president of Pakistan. He said, well, those people there in SWAT. That's what they deserve. And I said, why? He said, well, because they supported the Taliban. Maybe next time they won't support the Taliban. Collective punishment, if you will. It was an amazing sentence. For a pre and he's still in office. He's still our man. Why is he? We know why he's our man. He's acquiescent. He does what we want. And this is still, you know, it's shades of the Cold War. If, you, you know, if, if you're against Russia, you're our guy. Um, the policy of my country is really bizarre. Look, we're a great country. I don't think we, I think we often don't know what, everything we do. We don't understand the implications. As I said, there's no memory. Uh, uh, I say this as somebody, I think it's my obligation as an American citizen to speak out and say what I believe. It doesn't mean I don't, I, I don't want harm to my country. Um, I'm stunned and appalled that this president didn't do what he said he was going to do. He did say that Pakistan, that Afghanistan was the right war which unnerved us. We didn't know he'd expand it. You know, uh, Richard Nixon was elected in 1968, if you remember, over Humphrey. And he, one of his campaign plans was he announced that he had a secret plan to end the war. Well, it turned out his secret plan to end the war was to win it. He tried to win it, which is what, not what we thought he meant. Um, and Obama campaigned and saying it was the right war. Now he's put at least 30,000 more troops. He's got it, made a huge bet we're talking about, you know, God knows, in a time of great economic travail in America, um, he's he's betting he's betting the house. It's going to cost what does it cost uh, to keep an American soldier and the equipment? And we're we're, get, we're get up could be over a hundred thousand troops there soon. We're talking about many many billions a month a month, It'll probably be more than that, many more than that. It's it's an amazing risk he's taking for something about which if you had to ask even the senior commanders, what is the national interest of America, the national security interest of America in Pakistan? I mean in Afghanistan, you wouldn't get much. In Pakistan, what's our game? Our game is still to try to convince the Pakis, the Pakistani military and the, and the elite that their real enemy is not India, uh, but the, uh, the Taliban. And uh, A, uh, hating India is in the DNA of Pakistan, which is only matched when you go to Delhi and you start talking to the, the rational people there, it's in their DNA to hate Pakistan too. Two nuclear powers br bristling. And the other thing is, the, the, uh, as, as we know, the Pakistanis always considered the LET or the Haqqani tribe 
as a strategic reserve against India and certainly for Kashmir. They've always considered them to be sort of a forward force. And so by bombing in northern Waziristan and driving them out of their sanctuary, we're not killing them, we're spreading the insurgency. And it's just counterproductive. Everybody knows it is. Nobody can change the policy because generals aren't about to start acknowledging the lack of reality. We recently exchanged the, uh, there was a big story about the Pakistani head of the CIA was being sent back to America because he had been, oh horrors, named in a, a lawsuit. I will tell you, the head of the CIA is very well known in Pakistan. Everybody, everybody in the government understands who he is. He doesn't walk around shopping malls. He's always under great security. Uh, he was let go. When was the last time you ever heard of the American CIA publicly announcing the removal of a station chief? Like, never. Like, he apparently said, so I'm told, uh, I'm told by people that know, when uh, Petraeus issued a, a very optimistic report about the war in December that he gave to the president, um, uh, he just declared it was bankrupt. He just made it internally. He just said, this is completely wrong-headed. The policy is wrong-headed, off he goes, out he goes. That's the story I get. And it makes a lot more sense in the idea that because he was named in a lawsuit, uh, um, you just know who the station chief is. It's not that big of a secret anymore. And it, again, it's not as if he mingles with the people. Um, I'm so, I'm what, in my 70s now, I've given up being disillusioned about the CIA. They're trained to lie, period. They will lie to their president, they will lie certainly to the Congress, and they will lie to the American people. That's all there is to it. There are a lot of very good people in it. A lot of people in the CIA are first rate. A lot of them were idealistic, uh, joined for idealistic reasons, but I'm just, that's just the reality that I've come to. Um, I don't know why we keep that agency around. I don't see it does any good at all. It certainly didn't give us advance notice on Tunisia, at least none that we knew of. It was tabula risa for us, a complete surprise. We got to deal with, um, uh, so I don't see anything good coming out of Pakistan. Um, we have elaborate, elaborate plans to take the warheads. Um, uh, you know, of course, we'd be, we'd be uh, fighting with the Indians and the Israelis who all, always all have same plans. To, if Pakistan goes bad, the notion of a jihadist getting a warhead is terrifying, as it should be, um, assuming he's capable of firing it. Um, and if you got some, there are certainly a number of military people in the, in the Pakistani military who are certainly uh, um, uh, 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 capable of doing so and also very, very, uh, um, uh, uh, very much involved in jihadist activity that we know too. So there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of planning about what would happen. In case we thought it would happen, we'd do a preemptive raid. It would just be holy hell. It's a complete suicide mission. It's being planned and still being planned. Nobody stopped planning it. I wrote about it, but nobody cared because, you know, um, it's, it's very hard to confirm something I'm writing that's so deep in the, in the, in the subterranean world. Uh, but common sense would tell you um, that we are dealing quite heavily with the Indians on this, trading information, and of course, the Israelis. Meanwhile, Israel. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, I have a note here about Israel. I found my notes. I, 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 for a second, I think I didn't have them. So here's Israel today. Let's see. Um, could Obama prostrate himself anymore before the great God of Bibi? I doubt it. Um, he's prostrated himself pretty acutely, surprisingly giving his Cairo speech in May. Um, I think he's basically humbled himself. Um, um, uh, America still has an enormous amount of juice. The Israelis, as, as, you, as you can gather, their friendship with Turks the Turkish people has been strained, although they're going to maintain a tie. Um, and also, um, they still have ties with India that are close. And they have uh, very few other allies, but they have South Africa was, maybe still would be, I doubt as much as it was. Um, so uh, we're it. Um, Fatah gave them a deal that they could only dream about, and they rejected it. Um, they want The status quo is we're pretending they and us are pretending that Hamas doesn't exist, uh, which seems to make sense to they and us, but doesn't make sense to anybody else. Not only does Hamas exist, but Hamas probably would win any real election in the West Bank. 
um, uh, and probably gets 65 percent of the votes. That's what I hear that figure. Uh, nobody knows, maybe not. Um, but um, uh, what scares me about Israel is some of the stuff I'm seeing. Um, let's see. Uh, Meyer Dayan, Dayan, who is this very hard dose, the guy who did the, orchestrated the, uh, the assassination in Dubai, quits. He, after eight years, he's going to be replaced by a, name, a man named Tamir Pundo. Dayan is certainly no sweetie. He is not a sweetie pie, but he did favor dealing with Syria and the Golan Heights, and he also favored there's no rush about Iran that whatever intelligence they have, that magical intelligence that makes the Israelis know everything the Iranians want to do, and their plans to uh, uh, annihilate uh, Tel Aviv if they could, um, there was enough time. He even spoke publicly about sabotage taking place that uh, set him back five years. Never mind that the Iranians have had nothing but trouble in their own program for at least a decade and have not been able to get the centrifuges. They're still working P1s. They haven't gone to more advanced centrifuges. They have just an enormous, they have contamination. I don't think uh, they had a deal they were going to ship some stuff to be enriched by the Russians. I don't think the Russians would touch the Iranian um, uh, partially enriched or 3.3 or whatever it is, um, 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 enrichment. I don't think they would touch it because there's uh, contaminants and it might contaminate their centrifuges. And so um, uh, I think that's a reality. Uh, it's a mess there, but nonetheless, the Israelis claim sabotage did it, whatever the propaganda or whatever the truth is, I don't know. I have my doubts, but... Um, and um, he's being replaced by somebody who's not a bad guy, but going to be much more malleable on the issue of what do we do about Iran. Uh, the head of the IDF, Ghazi Ash uh, Gabi Ashkenazi, is considered to be uh, pretty much a moderate on things like... Um, um, uh, talking on the Golan Heights and um, uh, again about Israel, much less um, uh, 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 optimistic about uh, uh, talking about things in Iran, much less optimistic about this, any possibility of success. He's being replaced by a guy named Yorov Gallant, who was the southern commander who ran the war against Gaza, a war that within two days turned into a war against the population there. And there were a lot of people calling for war crimes. He's coming in. Uh, Yuval Diskin, the head of Shin Bet, is going to leave in May, and his replacement is going to also be another hardliner. And you have a situation where um, you have a BB now, uh, uh, Ehud Barak announced a new party, but still the coalition's going to stay, and Barak is also with him. He's with BB, and he's with Lieberman, and, and Yuzi Dayan, he's with him on the dangers of uh, Iran and Syria and of course, Palestine and Gaza, et cetera, he's with them. So you have a, a really shift to the right in the leadership of Israel, along with the shift that we're seeing all over in all militaries around the world, a shift to more, in America, it's becoming more Christian, more conservative, um, more, if you will, Knights of Malta in some serious, some serious in the special ops community. Um, in Israel, it's becoming, as some anybody you've all read, is, the, the, uh, the, the religious uh, zealots, or the, the ones who are more committed, um, uh, uh, more conservative, um, are now significant, I think 31% of the uh, officer corps in the Israeli army. The, uh, the army's moving to the right. And so what my friends worry about is they look at history, and in, um, uh, when um, uh, uh, Begin was uh, elected in 77, he did do Camp David. But then, after that, uh, beginning in about 1980, he made a series of changes. He replaced uh, Mordecai Gur, who was the IDF chief of staff, a very progressive person, with um, Rafi Tan. Uh, Isar Weitzman was replaced as defense minister by Sharon, uh, our friend Sharon. Uh, Moishi Dian, who was one of the people that was against the 67 expansions going across the borders, as was um, uh, others in Israel. That, that mistake that we're, that's going to be held up, it's hopeless, is replaced by Isaac Shamir. So, uh, and what happens out of that, that move to the right leads to the invasion of Lebanon. There's no dissent. So you can argue that the future in Israel, and here's how, what makes Israel so difficult. You can also say that they're doing all of this because they have Obama where they want him, and they want to keep the pressure on him. 
sort of like a madman theory that Nixon had. They want to say, look, we're all together. We're ready to go. What are you going to give us to keep us from going? Some more settlements? Whatever. That's also that possibility. In any case, it doesn't, there's just no sense um, that o Obama has, I want to see how much of a yap. What, are, where, what time is it? Who can see? I can't read a clock. Uh, I've been going how long? 45 minutes? How long? 40 minutes? Five more minutes. I don't. Um, uh, there's no, what I hear from my friends is he's not a great communicator. He is a great communicator in speeches. I mean, I, I listened to him make the speech in Phoenix or wherever it was, Tucson, and I, I just can't help but think I wish he had the same compassion for the civilians and military people on all sides in Afghanistan as he did for the people who were shot dead and, uh, and the, the wounded um, people in uh, Tucson. Um, I, I want to hear that too. And so um, uh, uh, he's not, he's not Hale, he's not a, in a funny way, he's not really a politician in the sense that you, you, you don't have easy relationship with him. He's not calling foreign ministers, he's not chatting away. Uh, most of the units operate by themselves. Hillary, Hillary um, uh, made this worldwide trip, among other things. She went into Yemen and was praising the Saudis, which is, are you kidding me? Going to Yemen and talking about Saudi Arabia favorably in terms of how they handle uh, uh, re-educating re, uh, re people coming out of Gitmo. Um, uh, you just don't want to do that. Um, maybe you do, but if, I hope you know what you're doing when you do it. Then, you know, there's a, a lot of enmity. And so um, nothing is cleared. The National Security Council, I understand, meets. They have deputies meetings and um, uh, write papers. Nothing happens. Uh, there's been no change in the policy. We're floating. It could be he's got a game plan. Uh, after all, Bush is the one who set the goal to get out of Iraq as 2011. He's going to play that out. And it could be that he's going to use money and lack of it to justify an earlier than planned a reduction of major reduction of forces in Afghanistan, but he's not going to be able to do that until he makes some sort of political accommodation. And you can only do that with Oman. Omar, you have to deal with him. I, I do believe that's so I'm told by everybody across the board. And people have gone back channel into the White House and said it and gotten nowhere. And people in the intelligence community. Um, it's, um, you know, I have a friend. I always, I always think about these stories about bureaucracy. There's a famous story that I was told by. I wrote a book years ago. Oh, I was dealing with um, the Kennedys, and I was dealing with the obsession, obsession with, uh, with uh, Castro, and the, 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 this insane desire by the Kennedys after the Bay of Pigs, Bobby and Jack, to get revenge and kill Castro, have him assassinated. And he's dead now, so I can mention it. There was a guy named Sammy Halperin. Sammy Halperin was the keeper of all the secrets in the CIA. He was a deputy in the, uh, of special op in the operations branch, the clandestine service. And, he was the guy that knew who we owned at where. He had the list of who we paid money to. And we say it that way, who we own, as if we think the money we give some foreign figure really buys them. It doesn't. It's not a question of renting somebody. We don't get what we think we're getting. We like to think we're getting more than we're actually getting. We're, getting, we're just getting somebody we give money to often. In any case, he told me the story one day. Desmond Fitzgerald was one of these old time, his, daughter, his daughter's Frankie, Francis Fitzgerald, the, the, what, writes these wonderful books about um, um, Fire in the Lake, some of you might remember. She's a wonderful journalist. And um, Des was one of those people who joined the CIA out of this notion of stopping communism and this sort of um, uh, wonderful, virtuous, many of the old time CIA people really came from a notion that this was the virtuous thing to do. And so, um, in late 72, he was promoted, he was Saigon bureau chief, to being branch minister for South Asia. Big promotion. And he now goes to Washington, where Sammy's his deputy, and they all sign in. And one of the things his secretary says to him is Robert McNamara, the secretary of defense, who, I will argue, is the psychotic liar of our time. He's hidden. He's the one who just fantasized the war, fantasized success, fantasized... Um, uh, if you remember, we measured success of war by how many you killed, uh, how many people you killed, and um, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just amazing the stuff he started and the inability he had to look at the truth, which he later acknowledged he knew, but he didn't deal with it in anything amounting to reasonable time. Um, so he had a, th a Friday 2 o'clock meeting with McNamara. 
that the, his predecessor had, and he was going to continue that. So the first Friday he's in office, he goes over to McNamara's office, and as he told Halpern later, he came back and he told McNamara what he thought about the war. Impossible to win. You were kidding yourself. The troops you were training were useless. And by the time he got back to his office, uh, McNamara's secretary called his secretary and discontinued the 2 o'clock meetings. That always struck me as a great sort of not atypical story. And so then I'm dealing a couple, about a year and a half ago, I, I'm with somebody deeply involved in that, about a year ago, um, I, somebody I knew for a long time, I'm, I'm having a seven o'clock breakfast with him in Washington. And um, off on background, I'm not gonna write about him, um, but it's all about, we're talking, he's very upset because at a meeting earlier, uh, there had been a major meeting, uh, of, uh, deputies, all the deputies and all the uh, intelligence and military agencies got together to discuss the Afghan war. And the progress of our way out in the Afghan war is to build up the Afghan army. That's our, so we're going to build them up, they're going to take over, and never mind that the Pashtuns are not interested in an army led by Tajiks, uh, what you will, or anybody from the Northern Alliance, never mind that reality. But, so he went to a meeting, and he's a backbencher, at which, in which um, everybody was talking about how wonderful it is we're going to have 100,000 trained and 120,000 next me. Uh, we're training all these soldiers, and it's great. Uh, a lot of them, there are a few problems. 60% um, of them are illiterate. We have to give them a little remedial work, whatever. And uh, don't know, a, even one of the problems they had is they would uh, put them in the quarters with nice toilets, and they would dismantle the toilets. They would be all gone. They would take away anything usable. That was a slight problem, a hitch. And so this meeting was led by somebody who may be the next Secretary of State when Gates uh, leaves next year, or this year, soon. Um, and um, they're going on, talking about how great things are. And at one point, he was asked by Holbrook, the late Holbrook, uh, what do you think? He said, let's get his view. And my friend told the truth. You're kidding yourself. Are you nuts? It's, are you kidding? Look what we did in Iraq. When Petraeus was in charge, King David was in charge of training, uh, what, uh, 50, 100,000 Shias came in, got uniforms, new rifles, ammunition, $300, spent a week and left. Uh, this is the same thing happening again. And the person leading the meeting went like this, and by the time he got back to his office, of course, he was told you can't come to any more meetings. You're done. Um, and that's how it was left. That's, uh, you would think that in 40 years we could do a little better, but we don't do better. And so I'm, I'm pretty skeptical. I, I know some of you will disagree. I know there's got to be more light than I see. I don't, it could be Obama has some thought he's going to do what he does. He's going to let the money people back in. Ruben and all the boys, the city court boys that caused the trouble are back in. He's going to hope that the Republicans will come up with nobody that galvanizes, which is very likely, and he'll be reelected. And then he's going to go to town in the second term. He's going to be the Abe Lincoln some of us thought he might be. He's certainly the smartest president we've probably had, if, if not since uh, Lincoln, certainly since Kennedy, who was also very bright, uh, as was Lincoln. Um, and it's just, I don't see it. I just see us lost in space. And the good thing is, uh, nobody pays that much attention to us anymore, which is good. We're much less important, but it's great. Um, the Lebanon thing is going to be played out. America can scream and yell. We have this thing about Nasrallah. He's the end of the world. He keeps on making speeches that aren't necessarily the end. He keeps on talking about staying within the Constitution. Um, but um, we're in a panic about it. Uh, well, we can't do anything about it. Uh, could we, could the president go and make, uh, pick up on the, on the Turkish issue? and join this coalition of, of Turks and Syrians and um, Iranians and Iraqis and add to it and g create a, a really prosperous growth area? Sure, really, no. Um, what will he do with North Africa? Um, I know what Bush, Cheney would have done, it wouldn't be very nice, they would go in on the other, you know, like Gaddafi apparently has, join in with the, uh, uh, Gaddafi must be having nightmares these days. But um, a lot of people are, I think, in, in, uh, in, in this part of the world uh, about what happened. 
Uh, I don't know what he's going to do. He, he, he's surprising. He couldn't, it looks like America's going to support what happened there and stay out of it. Uh, that's something that wouldn't have happened in the other administration. On the other hand, on the other hand, on the other hand, Afghan, Pakistan, Iraq are still going. And there's still torture. And there's still bad prisons. And there's still renditions that has not stopped. It's more subtle. There's many, many fewer. There's not as many as there were under Bush Cheney. Um, um, uh, we're still in a panic about particularly uh, North Africa, the Horn of Africa, and uh, that part of the world, HOA, we call it, uh, Djibouti. We're still, we have a huge, huge, huge combat special operations units operating out of Africa. Um, we see that as the next battleground. And um, uh, it will be, we'll, you know, with our, you know, I, I just see us as, I see all of this stuff as the assassinations, the killing is counterproductive, and there's a historical parallel. In 87, the Russians tried to assassinate their way out of their hole. I'm just, in Spetsnaz, they went on a huge assassination kick in Afghanistan, and they got nothing out of it. This is historical. I'm, these are all empirical facts. The Russians got nothing out of it. We're in an assassination kick again. We're going at night with our, with our unmarked planes, dropping, a, by the way, that one of the things that's wonderful because the Predator missile is killing so many people randomly, the solution has been they've set out bidding last year and last year for a smaller warhead for the, uh, for the Predator, the unmanned plane. And I think the whole idea of using unmanned planes and, uh, is also another moral issue. So um, you've got a million questions. This hasn't been a laugh riot, I'm sorry. Um, but it's not a laugh riot. This is a, 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 remains a very serious time. And uh, this guy is either going to step up, which is very possible. It's very possible he just wants to get a second term and he's going to show some smoke and really go at it and tell the Israelis, you can't have the $3.0 billion plus unless you make some changes. But I don't think it's going to happen. And I will tell you, I know Israelis, dedicated Israelis who fought and bled for their country, uh, one in particular I know, um, that are advising Fatah now uh, on grounds that it's a patriotic thing to do because they're, they're on some sort of a suicide mission right there. And uh, uh, I don't think anybody wants that to happen either. The consequences of that are just too powerful. So we'll see.